Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for RedGiantTV.com. Submitted for your examination is one Chad Perkins, digital artist, tutorial presenter extraordinaire, advocate of animator kind, so to speak. Chad woke up today planning to head right out to work, but before he gets to the door, he'll be taken on a brief detour to the other side of the Twilight Zwin. Okay, uh, I did not see that coming, but uh, I guess it's better than getting sued. In this episode of Red Giant TV, Seattle-based digital artist and filmmaker Chad Perkins is going to walk us through how he created many of the elements in that excellent Twilight Zone-esque opening you just saw. He'll be working in After Effects, Illustrator, Photoshop, and Cinema 4D. Now, I have to personally thank Chad for a favor that he did for me long ago without even knowing it. Between Total Training, Lynda.com, and VTC, Chad has over 25 training series, and one of those series helped me out on a gig with a tight deadline. Thanks, man, you totally saved me. And now Chad has learned that in this world, no good deed goes unpunished, as he has been relentlessly pursued and pressed into making tutorials for a man who erroneously believes that he sounds like Rod Serling. Take it away, Chad. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at some of the things I did to create this little project here. So basically what we're going to be focusing on here is uh, some alternatives to traditional 3D. If you're not a big fan of 3D rendering programs, there are a few things here, namely some trap code plugins, uh, some native After Effects things, working with Photoshop CS4 Extended, as well as working with uh, Illustrator and a little bit of Cinema 4D, even though it's kind of cheating. And we'll also look at Shatter, which is a 3D environment inside of After Effects. Now, I'm kind of new to this whole trap code suite thing, uh, but I just got it. And even though I, st I still totally suck at it, I was able to get in and uh, contribute a lot to this project with some cool trap code plugins with minimal effort on my part. So I'm going to show you how I did that as well. We'll also be looking a little bit at the original soundtrack I wrote for this. And we'll also be uh, playing around with an expression to make uh, this text kind of flicker on and off. That's kind of fun. Now, first off, let's look at making the stars in the background with Particular. This is uh, quite easy, actually. I'm just going to go ahead and apply Particular to a solid. And thankfully, uh, like most trap code plugins, there's a huge wealth of presets here. So I just chose uh, one of these uh, Starfield HDs here. Starfield Static 1, that'll work. And then uh, it gives you the first frame off. And then it starts exploding these stars and they just stay static. So what I did is I just drag this layer to the left so that we didn't have to worry about it exploding on. Open up the world transform, uh, the Z offset, take that up a little bit so we back out. And then I animated this slowly descending so that the stars would appear to kind of come towards you creepily. And so if we look at the final result again, we could see in the background that the stars are kind of zooming towards you creeping your way. I figured that would make things a little bit more tense. Uh, next, let's go ahead and look at the swirls that were made in Echo Space. And that's, these are these swirls right here at the beginning. Now, if you're not familiar with Echo Space, basically it's a layer duplicator, but it allows you to transform the layers while you're duplicating them and sets up a structure for you to control the duplicates. So apply Echo Space to this uh, regular old black solid. And actually, before I do that, I want to uh, apply something to duplicate. So I'm actually going to use the circle effect. Uh, shameless plug here, I wrote this book called The After Effects uh, Illusionist that covers every effect in After Effects. And in the process of writing that book, I uh, learned a lot of little quirky, weird uh, effects that are, aren't very common, like this circle effect um, that I found to be kind of helpful in some circumstances, such as this one. Uh, so basically what circle does is it makes a circle, but allows you to customize a little bit. I dragged that before Echo Space so that Echo Space would be copying the circle. I'm going to take the edge value to edge radius. I'll take the radius up to about uh, 230 or so. And I'm going to take edge radius to about 290. There we go. Next, I'm going to open up feather. And I'm going to take feather inner. That's this lower feather value here. I'm going to take that up to about uh, 100 or so. That looks good. 
Another weird effect that really doesn't come in handy too often, but I used in this project is bevel alpha. And so I went ahead and applied that here, took the edge thickness up to about uh, 25 or so, give or take basically creates kind of like this cool little lip around the, the object. And that makes for a more interesting uh, 3D object once it's duplicated in 3D space by Echo Space. Now you might be wondering why we didn't use uh, Bevel and Emboss, the Photoshop layer style, which you can get to by right clicking on a layer, going to layer styles and Bevel and Emboss. The reason is because layer styles get all quirky and weird when you move them in 3D space and we need this to not be quirky and weird. So uh, I opted for this uh, rarely used effect. Now I'm going to close these effects up and open up Echo Space, open up Setup. This is where we specify how many instances of this circle layer will be created. I only need about eight for this, so I'm going to change instances to eight. I'm going to open up Repeater. Next, I'm going to change uh, Z Offset to negative 55, and I'm going to change Scale to about 30. And these basically control each duplicate, how much they will be offset from each other. Now that's good enough for now, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the repeat button. That's the first button here on the left to make this happen. And as you can see, as we zoom out, we have a whole bunch of three-dimensional layers. Now I made this far bigger than I needed to for a reason because I knew that I would be zooming in closely to this. And so I wanted to make sure that I had uh, these circles high res enough so that if I zoomed in close to them, I wouldn't uh, they wouldn't get pixelated. We'll zoom out so we can see all of these uh, circles a little bit better in just a moment. Uh, if we adjust the Y offset value, value, you'll notice that there is still a relationship between these circles. This is a live uh, relationship that's created because of all the expressions created in the nulls here in the timeline created for you by Echospace. Now, in order to get the effect that I wanted for the intro, I had to do a couple little quirks. And there's probably a better way to do this, but just my ignorance, I didn't know how to do it. So this is uh, what, I, what I did. So I made these layers all 3D here. I also made a new null object. I'm going to call this uh, Master Null because there's already a bunch of null objects in this composition all created for you by Echo Space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to parent uh, the main black solid to this master null. And all these other solids are parented to these respective nulls, which are parented to this main null. And so I'm gonna parent this main null also to our master null. And that's a lot of null jive, so hopefully uh, that's not too confusing. Uh, and I'm gonna hit, uh, after making this 3D, I'm gonna hit P for position, and I'm going to zoom out uh, so I can see all of my um, objects here, all of my circles. And actually, I'm not really zooming out. I'm just moving uh, this null in, uh, in Z space. Now, here's what I want to have happen. I want to just use circles so that they still have the same relationship maintained, but they're kind of off-center a little bit. And then I want to have this master null have its anchor point in the center and have all those circles rotate around the center to create the effect that I'm looking for. So I'm actually temporarily going to take the uh, relationship of the black solid to none, no parent there, and I'll take the main null back to uh, none. And actually I need to parent the black solid null back to the original uh, main null temporarily. Uh, go back to the black solid and adjust the Y offset so that these circles are kind of like this where they're all off-centered here. And now we can go back uh, to this master null, and I'm going to change the uh, the anchor point position by holding down the letter Y on the keyboard and moving this to about the center of the back circle. And now, having made that adjustment, I can take the black solid, uh, parent that back to the master null, go back down to the main null, parent that to the master null. And now when I go back to the master null, and I'm going to hit R for rotation, and I animate Z rotation, then everything seems to have this kind of cool spirally thing that we had in uh, the intro to our Twilight Zone movie here. And actually what I need to do is hit Shift P for position and back out a little bit here and raise this up so we can get this where we want to. And actually what I did is I used a camera to navigate through these, uh, these circles here, but you can kind of see what I got going on there as I move uh, Z rotation that everything spins around here. So um, everything is spinning around this uh, centric uh, anchor point from the master null. And so this circle spins farther around and the other circles don't spin quite as much and it creates this cool like spirally thing. 
Now, at this point, you might also choose to go back and you know play with the uh, circle settings or the bevel alpha settings um, to remove some of this edge or add more of it or make it more prominent, whatever you want to do there. One cool thing about Echo Space is that it's a complete 3D environment because it's just duplicating our layers in 3D space. So I can go ahead and right click and make a new light. And let's go ahead and make a new spotlight. And, um, and we could play with the lighting settings on, on this echo space here. Uh, one of the things that I did in the Twilight Zone uh, little project here uh, to make things look all vintage-y style, uh, I, I created spotlights and I, I kind of fiddle with them a little bit. I adjust, adjusted the uh, feather so there's less feather and I also reduced the cone angle on the light to produce these kind of like harder edge, uh, harder edges here. So if we go back to our light, open up light options and we can take down our feather and we could also take down the cone angle and create these like kind of harder edge shadows, which seem creepier and also more vintage as well. Now, moving on, the next object that we encounter in our tour through the Twilight Zone is this cool little uh, 3D door that opens up that the camera kind of goes through. And I created this door from scratch in After Effects using solids. So if I go to the 3D door composition I have here and we turn on this light, we can see this uh, this door. Uh, I'm going to turn off the light here, and I'm going to solo this layer here. Uh, I created this door outline in Illustrator. Use this as kind of like a template. So I made solids, and I uh, shaped them, scaled them, and positioned them so that they would all kind of fit this template. And then I added layers in 3D so that it would be a fully 3D door. We go over here. At the bottom of the composition panel, the little uh, square with the lightning bolt. These are fast preview preferences. And we can take this to wireframe, and you can see all the different solids lined up there in 3D space. And I'm going to just take this back to adaptive resolution here. One of the cool tricks I wanted to show you about this door that's kind of fun in working with solids, if I open up uh, one of these bevel pre-comps here, these are like the, uh, the beveled part, uh, part of the door uh, on the front. There's four of them. I created these by duplicating them. And I created solids and then just duplicated them. And the benefit of that is that After Effects maintains that relationship. It remembers that these solids were duplicates of each other. So if I select one of them and hit Command-Shift-Y on the Mac or Control-Shift-Y on the PC, I'll open up those solid settings again. And then if I click the color swatch, let's say I make this red, and I check this option that says Affect All Layers That Use This Solid, it will affect 12 layers. Click OK. And I go back to the 3D door and all of the solids used to make the beveled edges on this door turn red. So kind of a fun little trick when working with solids. And uh, you know, I'm a big fan of being able to get in there with solids because so many objects that you see in the real world and that you work with, you know, computers or desks or whatever, they're just made out of flat edges. It's, you know, solids aren't great just for you know, ceilings and floors and walls. They can also be used to make rudimentary objects. Obviously, this is not the best workflow. It's much faster to go into an actual 3D program like a Cinema 4D or something and actually construct a 3D door. But not everybody has the, the money for a 3D program or the time to learn one. So this is kind of like an alternative uh, if you don't have a 3D program or if you're in a pinch and you need to make something uh, real quickly like uh, play around with solids. Uh, another object or the next object that we encounter here after we go through the door is this uh, 3D eyeball that kind of looks at you. Uh, and this eyeball is a fully three-dimensional eyeball. You can see that here, the 3D eye. And we have a camera here that we can select. And I'll put click C for my camera tool. And we could move this around. You can see that it's a fully uh, three-dimensional object. And this object, this eyeball, was made entirely from scratch in Photoshop. 3D-ness and everything. Let me show you how I did that. I'm going to go over to Photoshop. And uh, here is the eyeball in Photoshop. And if we select the layer here, I select my 3D rotate tool. And I can move this around. And you can see that it is actually three-dimensional. You see that even these specular highlights stay in place. Kind of cool. And by the way, this tutorial, this part of the tutorial in Photoshop will only work in Photoshop CS4 Extended. If you have just a regular version of Photoshop CS4 or if you have Photoshop CS3 Extended, this won't work. So here's what I did. Started from scratch with a uh, white document, made a black circle, then I made a green circle, added some noise, added some radial blur to that noise. Then on top of that, I added a uh, blue circle and then I added some noise and some radial blur to that. And then finally, I added the pupil, which was a little black circle that I then uh, blurred a little bit with Gaussian blur, and we have our eyeball. 
And now that our texture is done, we can wrap it around a 3D sphere, which we can do right here from Photoshop. But one of the things with this trick is that uh, Photoshop doesn't really have that great uh, 3D mapping features. So in order for this to look good, I had to actually distort this so that uh, it looks all weird like that. Uh, not the best, but that's the way it looks best on a 3D surface. So with this texture selected, go to the 3D menu, select new shape from layer. And basically what that's going to do is it's going to take one of these uh, pre-made 3D objects and wrap your currently selected layer around that 3D object. So I'm going to select sphere. And as you can see, it wraps the material around the sphere it created for you. And again, selecting the 3D object tool, we can see that this is a real three-dimensional eye that we can move around and, uh, and play with. If you're really into 3D, you can see if we go to the window menu that there's a new 3D panel. I'm not going to get into this here, uh, but we can play with uh, models, materials, uh, lighting. We can play with uh, other aspects of materials such as uh, bump strength and self-illumination, shininess, all that kind of stuff. So I played around with that a little bit until I got... Um, this eyeball with the correct specularity here. So these pinpoint kind of um, specular highlights make it look a little bit shinier and glossier, more like an eye would look. So then what you do is you go back to After Effects and import this file, this PSD file, as a composition with the live Photoshop 3D option enabled. And it creates a camera for you and a null object for you. And it even applies this live Photoshop 3D effect. And we can basically uh, use a camera to go around uh, this object and move it around it in 3D space in After Effects. So if we go to uh, the final project here, you can see I just uh, animated the rotation to kind of turn kind of sharply there, look at you and creep you out. Now, next up in the Twilight Zone project, we have uh, this little headless girl flying through space with a basket with a goose in it. That's really creepy. And also this uh, weird astrological symbol that spins. Uh, that's all just plain generic After Effects stuff, so I won't get into that. Uh, and then it explodes and there's these cool circles and then our project kind of melts into a color project and the text animates on. Uh, I want to talk about these little uh, swirls right here. I actually made these using 3D Stroke, another trap code effect that was so easy to use. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and apply that 3D Stroke effect. Now, a lot of times when you're using 3D Stroke, uh, you'll have paths that you're working with. But uh, in this case, I'm just going to use a preset. I'm going to take this preset drop down to concentric circles and voila, no pass needed. We have uh, this cool little shape right here. And I'm going to open up Taper and enable Taper. So the edges of these uh, stroked lines are tapered. Looks kind of cool. And we can play with this a little bit. Maybe take uh, thickness up a little bit. Maybe feather this a little bit. And what I did, one of the things I did to animate this, bring this to life, is I uh, animated offset. However, if you, if you move offset a little bit, you'll notice it kind of uh, disappears very quickly. So what I do is select this loop option. And then as we move this around, we get this kind of like weird, trippy uh, loop thingy going on. I also opened up transform here and I adjusted uh, Z position. So that, that would be bigger. And the other thing that I did to animate this is I increased bend to about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, somewhere around there. And then you uh, animate bend axis and you get this weird spaced out weirdness. <laughs> now, another thing I did that I'll just mention here, I won't uh, demonstrate because it'll take a little a while, but for these swirls, I kind of wanted them just to be swirls on the outside. I didn't want uh, stuff on the outside. Uh, I wanted this to kind of like fade out on the edges. And I also wanted it to be black in the center. So what I did is I used lights to accomplish this. Uh, I used this regular old spotlight um, with uh, feathered edges to create these kind of like vignette around the edge. But for the center, what I did is I created a light and I had the brightness actually a negative value, which actually removes light from a scene. So I kind of used a light to suck out light, which is kind of weird, but sucked out light from the center of these swirls. Uh, another thing, too, is that uh, as this kind of you'll see this kind of dissolve into pink swirls. And what I did there is I just animated the color. Uh, from you know white to deep purple or pink or whatever. And so over time, it gradually changes from white to that purple color. Now, and what I think is probably th the coolest part of this tutorial, we're going to look at Shatter. First of all, let me clue you into what I did with this 3D text here. I started out with regular old text in Illustrator. 
And then I broke it apart to outlines so I could use the direct selection tool to select some of these points. Maybe use the rotate tool and kind of tweak this a little bit, make the text look a little bit more twilight zony, for lack of a better term. Then I export this out as like an ancient Illustrator file. I think it had to be like Illustrator 3 or something like that. And I imported this into Cinema 4D where I added some camera movement and, and some rotation and lighting and stuff like that. The reason why I use Cinema 4D, I realize that the tutorial is kind of about 3D alternatives. So using uh, Cinema 4D for my 3D is kind of cheating a little bit. But Cinema 4D has uh, the ultimate selection of a beveling tool. So if you want to bevel stuff, uh, it really is the, the, the ultimate tool to use. So while I tried to avoid real 3D for this tutorial, I just I cu I couldn't stay away. I couldn't stay away. I had to have my beveled edges from... Cinema 4D. It's just such a pleasure. Again, it's too much to get into right now, but I just couldn't stay away from uh, these sweet beveled edges uh, from uh, Cinema 4D. So getting back to After Effects here, I have my Cinema 4D text now, uh, but this is rendered text. This is just a simple image sequence. These are target files. They're flat. So even though the text appears to kind of like turn towards you in 3D, if we turn this layer into 3D and rotate it, we'll see that it's completely flat. It's just a postcard. Even though it looks like there's some perspective there, there isn't. It's just a flat layer. Now, I'm going to remove 3D from this layer. And I want to talk about another great component of 3D and After Effects, and that is the shatter effect. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that to my text here. First thing I want to do is take the view from wireframe and forces to rendered and move back in time a little bit so we can see this text before it really blows up. Cool thing about Shatter is this is a real three-dimensional environment. So moments ago, we spun the camera around or we rotated the layer actually, and we saw that it was completely flat. But if we go to camera position, uh, animate uh, or move Y rotation, we can see that there's actually some depth here. There's some thickness. And if we go to the shape area here and uh, increase extrusion, we'll see that uh, this actually is really thick 3D. Let me go ahead and increase the curves here so we can bring out the brightness just so we can see how that's going there. So we can see here now clearly that it is in fact 3D. And actually if we move in time, you can see that as these pieces explode, there are three-dimensional bricks. Now we're gonna be coming back to that. For right now, I want to uh, close up curves and just reset this effect. And then again, take the view back to rendered. I'm gonna take the pattern from bricks to glass, and then I'm going to also increase the repetitions until we have kind of a, more of like a shattery type look. I kind of wanted this like scary shattery type thing going on with my text here. Now the problem is, is that shatter just blows stuff up. From the first frame of the layer, it just blows it up. It doesn't have any regard for what's going on in your layer or whatever. It just blows it up. So the problem then is I just want this little crack on my text and it just it just blows it up. So here's what I'm going to do to fix it. I'm going to go to um, physics and I'm going to increase viscosity to one. The viscosity refers to the thickness of the air that these particles or this, this text is blowing up in. So basically by making the air really thick, the particles blow up, but they don't really go too far because it's like they're getting blown up in jello or some other thick thing. But the problem is, is that they blow up and then they start just kind of drooping downwards because gravity is pulling them down. So let's just go ahead and remove gravity, take this from three to zero. And now this text really won't do too much over time. It'll just kind of blow up and stay there. Now my text is a little bit too exploded. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read. So I'm gonna open up force one and I'm gonna take down the strength of the explosion so it doesn't blow it away that much. And that's looking pretty awesome. Also, I noticed that, um, and actually we can see this clear if we take this back to uh, wireframe and forces in the view dropdown. But uh, this radius right here, this uh, teal circle, everything that's in that circle blows up and nothing outside of it blows up. So we're noticing if we could take this back to rendered again, uh, that some of our text is not blowing up and that doesn't look all that great. So I'm going to increase the radius value until all of our text is cracked. Now, seems all fun and good, right? Well, here's the problem, or the first of many problems. If we go out to about two seconds here, somewhere around there, uh, where we can see the text. Actually, let me shrink my timeline so I can see it all here. As we go out in time here, um, and I play this, you'll see one of the problems. The text is still moving because these layers are moving, but the shatter map is not moving. And so if we back this up and then play that, you could see that it looks like the camera lens is cracked. The text is not really cracked. It's the camera lens because the cracks are staying in the same place. They're not moving with the text. 
This is because Shatter doesn't care what's on the layer. To Shatter, this layer is just a flat layer, and that's it. So no matter what's moving on the surface, the layer itself is still staying put. And that's why we're getting this weird effect. Okay, so when I was making this tutorial, I raised up the white flag and realized, okay, well, I can't get Shatter to make it look like it's moving in 3D space along with my text. That's just not going to happen. So I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to make this flicker, just like how we have it uh, in the final product here. We have the text, and then occasionally it will flicker with the shattered text, and uh, that's kind of cool. But another problem we have here is that that won't work. Shatter doesn't have an unshatter button. There's no glue to put everything back together once you've shattered it. So we can't animate this text to shatter and then unshatter and then shatter again. So here was my solution. It's kind of an interesting one, is that I made two layers here. I duplicated the layer. This top one we'll call shattered. And this bottom one we'll call regular. And on the regular layer, beneath the shattered layer, I removed the shatter effect. So we have two layers. We have one that blows up and we have one that does not. And so my reasoning was, is that if I could switch between these two, so in other words, we move on for a few seconds and then the visibility of the regular layer turns off, the shattered layer turns on, and they kind of flicker back and forth, then I could create that illusion. Problem is, I don't have the patience to do that with keyframes, so I had to use expressions to make this happen. So I uh, created a new null object, and I'm going to add the checkbox control, expression control, to this layer. And basically, the checkbox uh, control is just a dummy that has an on and off switch, and that's it. But that's perfect for what we're looking for here. So let's start with the shattered layer and go to the opacity of the shattered layer. And I am going to create an expression here by option or alt clicking the uh, opacity stopwatch. And we're going to create kind of like an if then statement. Type if, and then in parentheses, you type a condition. And then after the parentheses, you specify what happens if the condition is met. So um, if I said, if I eat only donuts, then I get fat. So that's the kind of expression that we're creating. If, condition, and then what happens if the condition is met. So then I'm going to say if, and then open up a parentheses here, and then use the pick whip to drag to the checkbox. And actually, let's go ahead and open this up so we can see box control. Okay, there we go. Now let's go back to our expression again. If, and with the cursor right there after that parenthesis, we'll go ahead and select the checkbox control. And so if this equals, and basically the way this works is that if it's off, it represents a value of zero. And if it's on, it's only other value, then the value is one. So if this is set to off, in other words, if this is equal to zero, and that's what these two equal signs mean, it means is equal to. So if this is equal to zero, in other words, if it's off, okay, then close the uh, parenthesis because that's the condition. If this is set to off, then opacity equals zero. Then hit return to go down to the next line, and we'll say something similar. If parenthesis Checks box, checkbox here. Two equal signs. If this value, the checkbox value, is equal to one, end parenthesis, that's the end of the condition, opacity equals 100. And then we could click outside of the expression to accept it. So let's go ahead and test it and make sure everything works okay. So if it's set to off, opacity will be zero. Good enough, it's working. Click on it once, it's set to on, opacity is 100%. So we've now created this layer on off button. Super sweet. Now, once we've done that, the hard part is over. So I'm gonna go to the regular layer, turn that on, hit T for opacity, option click to uh, get an expression here. And actually, I'm gonna select the original expression that we created already. I'm gonna copy it with command control C, command control V to paste it. And then what we're gonna do is just switch out the values. So we're going to make it so that uh, if the checkbox is set to on, then opacity is zero for the regular layer. And if um, the switch is set to off, then opacity is 100%. So basically the exact opposite of the switch. So when we click on, we're basically swapping out the two layers. 
off, on, off, on. And we did all that without any keyframing, super quick and easy thanks to that awesome if then expression. And what's really cool about the checkbox control is that it doesn't interpolate, which is perfect for our needs. So I can click the stopwatch for checkbox, um, move over a couple frames, turn this on, move over a couple frames, turn it off again and we have this really cool flicker that just kind of like pops on for a second in a creepy way which is great and as you can see here these are already hold keyframes so there's not going to be any interpolation from uh, frame to frame which is great just as a quick tip another thing that I did is uh, I went in and I created uh, an adjustment layer on top of the twilight zone layer uh, with levels and glow and stuff like that and I added the same expression to that adjustment layer so when it shattered um, it not only shattered it also got a little bit brighter and a little bit more glowy as well. Now, finally, for those of you that are music fans, one of the things I think that really helped this piece out a lot was this original score that I wrote in Logic Pro. But I wrote it with MIDI, and you could have just as easily done this with uh, GarageBand or Reason or any other uh, app that has MIDI and software instruments. So uh, this original score is kind of uh, fun if you want to hear it real quick. So as you can see, not too much going on. A few strings, some brass, blah, blah, blah. Uh, really not too much to um, impress you, actually. But, uh, but it worked for the piece. So there we have it. The little Twilight Zone tutorial that could. <laughs> and uh, thanks to some alternative 3D methods and some really quick and easy trap code presets, we, I was able to make this tutorial in no time flat, and it was a blast. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Chad Perkins. Take care. Thanks, Chad. Man, you were totally in the zwin zone. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this was a huge project created entirely from scratch, and obviously, even in 30 minutes, Chad couldn't cover everything that he did to complete it. But I think it's a great exploration and overview of the many different aspects that go into creating a final product like this. Very impressive. Anyway, if you've enjoyed Chad's presentation, he's got a lot of in-depth training in the subjects of After Effects, Photoshop, Flash, and much more, which you can find at lynda.com, Total Training, and VTC. Also, Chad recently authored the book, The After Effects Illusionist, through Focal Press. It covers an explanation of every effect that ships with After Effects through CS4. It's a great resource for learning about popular and obscure effects that could make your job easier. Man, keeping up with this guy is hard to do. He's like all over the place. So to keep it simple, check out his blog at chadperkins.net and follow him on Twitter as chad underscore perkins. You'll be glad you did. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for RedGiantTV.com. See you next time.